Good afternoon. My name is Jasmine Tobias. I'm an associate with the Dallas Office of Holland and Knight. On behalf of the DAYL Judiciary Committee, I would like to welcome you all to our inaugural series um, of Judges Making History. Today, we're going to start with our first CLE, um, and it is featuring my first boss in the legal industry, the Honorable Sam A. Lindsay, in a conversation moderated by Grant Schmidt. Grant is a senior associate at Winston & Strawn here in Dallas, and he also clerked for Judge Lindsay. He's a graduate of UT Law, um, and he is the creator and host of the Dallas-based po podcast, I Do This Because. Most importantly, he is the husband to Cynthia, an attorney here in Dallas, and the father to four beautiful girls, including a newborn that was just born very early Sunday morning. Before we get started, I'd also like to take a moment to thank our sponsors, Bell Nunnally, Shalaki Law, Dorsey, Fee Smith Sharp, and Villanova, my apologies, Jonathan Childers, Castle Law, Lynn Pinker, Hurst, and Schwedman, Platt Chima, Rich, Platt Chima and Richmond PLLC, the Stewart Law Group, and Carrington Coleman. Okay, Grant, take it away. All right. Thank you, Jasmine. Thank you, DOIL. Thanks for everyone uh, for being here. This is a fun opportunity. Uh, Judge Lindsay does not um, need an introduction, but I will uh, give him one anyway. Many of you already know him. You've had the opportunity to meet with him or meet him. He is United States District Court Judge in the Northern District of Texas. He was nominated by President Clinton in 1997. He was uh, confirmed after a contentious 51 to 49. I'm just kidding. He was confirmed unanimously by the U.S. Senate in March 1998. Prior to his current position as a federal judge, he went to St. Mary's University, earning a degree in history and government, graduating magna cum laude. He received his JD from UT Law. He served as a staff attorney for the Texas Aeronautics Commission and then joined the Dallas City Attorney's Office and worked his way up very rapidly throughout the office and ultimately became Dallas City Attorney. Um, and most importantly, he's a devoted husband and father to three very impressive young women. He's been a strong mentor to, to many of us throughout his 20 plus years on the bench. And you cannot take him anywhere to any restaurant or any location without people recognizing him and telling him how much he means to them. So Judge, thank you for being with all of us. I'm excited for this conversation. Glad to be here. So, Judge, we're going to have kind of a conversation. I'm not just going to ask questions. I want to interact with you. But we're going to start in the year 1956. You are five years old. You're living in South Texas. So tell us what life is like as five-year-old Sam Lindsay. It was hard. You already learned to work. I grew up on a farm, so the minute you can start walking – you start getting assigned different chores. And that's the way it was. At age six, I was picking cotton. As you know, my parents owned the farm. I was picking cotton. I had a little short cotton sack, and I picked cotton right along with my older brothers and older sisters. So there's always something to do on a farm. So one thing about a farm, if you work, a, work on a farm, you will learn what it means to work hard. And we certainly learned that. Well, well, Judge, you mentioned your siblings. I know you were, uh, I think you were one of 10 siblings. So where did your personality fit among your brothers and sisters? Well, all of us, I would say, probably have type A personalities, but it's manifested differently. And just a slight correction. Actually, there were 11 of us born. 10 of us made it to adulthood. I'm smack dab in the middle. I was number seven, number six. So as far as personalities, like I said, we all have strong personalities, but there are different ways of showing it. Some of us are more vocal. Some of us are subdued, but very strong, very resolute. I sort of put myself in that category. So when an older brother or sister gets out of line and wants to dominate too much, then that's when I come in and say, wait a minute, hold the brakes. We're not going to do it like that. So I guess I would have a common effect. I mean, it's a strong personality, but it's also a common effect because sometimes type A persons want to do things, what I would say is done in a precipitous fashion. And I will say, hold on, let's consider all angles before we jump off into the river. 
So, Judge, in addition to your role as, as a sibling here, you were out on the farm. You mentioned quite a bit. I know, obviously, you, you learned a very intense work ethic. Uh, but what, what are some of the specific takeaways, some of the things that you continue to think about when you're on the bench and you're working behind the scenes and you're burning the midnight oil? What are some of the things that the lessons that you learned out on the farm, out as a kid, among these many siblings with your parents that you, that you truly live out uh, each day? Well, one thing my father and mother both said was never let anybody outwork you. You can work hard. If you're lacking in one area, you can make up by working hard. And my father had a saying that went something like this. Nobody ever died from hard work and nobody ever drowned to death in sweat. So that pretty much sums it up. You know, just for example, we were all expected to go to college. And the reason why was because my father dropped out of school at the beginning of the seventh grade. Now, the problem is he didn't start the school until he was 10 years old because my grandfather took the position that if a boy, and those are his words, had three or four years of quote unquote learning, that was enough. As long as he could read the newspaper and do his numbers, the math, add and subtract, multiply. That was good enough. So he didn't start until he was 10 years old. He never failed or anything, but he was 17 years old <laughs> in the seventh grade, much bigger than the rest of the kids. And so finally, you know, he, he said, this is not for me anymore. So he dropped out. Now he said that was the biggest mistake he made in his life. That is why he stressed education so much. When we, grew, when we were 18 and graduated from high school, you had two choices, go to college or get out of the house and get a job. If you had a job, you would not be expected to stay at the house. You on your own. To use their words, you an adult, therefore you should support yourself. So all of us, you know, went to college. All siblings have an advanced degree, a master's or else beyond that. So, Judge, so what, given, given what your father taught you, what, uh, what were some of the things, if you would have reached back out, if you would reach out to, to senior in high school, Sam Lindsay, and you were to say, hey, um, just so you know, in your future, you're going to be city attorney of a major metropolitan area. You're going to be the first black judge, first black federal judge in Dallas, and you're going to serve a lifetime appointment on the bench. What do you think uh, senior in high school, Sam Lindsay, how do you think he would have reacted? I would have probably said that's far-fetched. That's a dream. Because remember, when I graduated from high school, that was in 1970. We were only six years past the Civil Rights Act of 1964, five years past the Voting Rights of 1965, and two years past the Housing Act, which outlawed uh, discrimination based on race and among um, several other things. So I would have said that would have seemed to be a pipe dream. But again, my parents always told me, work hard, always give your best performance, even if you're working for free. My father had no tolerance for anybody who did not do his or her best job. And if you did not, he would let you know about it. So as most young people, you always want to please your parents. So you worked extra hard. So your parents will not be disappointed uh, with you. But I would have thought all that was a pipe dream. I, I do remember, even before I was in the 12th grade, I remember we were talking about federal judges in a civics class. And Miss Eunice Yosis was, was our teacher. And she just passed away. She'd like about, about three years ago. She was 98 years old. So that would make over about 101 if she was still alive today. And she was telling us about the Constitution, three branches of government, all, all of that. And so she was saying how Judge Garza was appointed by President Kennedy. And we said, did he get to meet the president? And she said, well, I'm sure he did. And we all said, wow, because at that time, it's seventh graders, seventh grade boys, you're interested in movie stars, athletic figures, and people like the president. We just said, wow. And she said, now, wait a minute. He said, who knows? One of you could be a federal judge. 
and being silly 13 years old, 13 year olds at the time, we all laughed. Thought that was so ridiculous. And she got she got upset, fussed at us, held us after class, and gave us a stern lecture about civics and duty to your country. So anyway, when I became a federal judge, I called her and she said, Yes, I remember that. She said, I think you laughed the most. And she said, I think I have the last laugh, last laugh because <laughs> I I uh, predicted correctly. But anyway, I always think back on that story and what that tells me, and that's what I tell a lot of young people, never sell yourself short. Never let anybody make you feel inferior because if you have the self-confidence and you have the intellectual capacity and the will, you can do about anything you want to do. Now, there may be obstacles you have to overcome, but you at least have to have confidence in yourself. You have to have the will and determination and the intellectual ability. No, I, I love that, Judge. So relatedly, you, you and I have discussed this quite a bit. We've discussed a lot of the adversity that you had to overcome even to, to get to law school. And one, one thing I'm, I'm curious about, could you, could you tell us you know, a specific example of, if any, of racial discrimination that, that you faced, whether it was during law school or even at the city attorney's office or all the way up to now, that really stood out in your mind that provided some uh, provided motivation for for you to do all these things that we just discussed? All right, well, let me say this first. And I want to make this unequivocally clear, and this is not a shot at anybody, but racism still exists today. And it's in all branches of the government. It's in all institutions in our society. Now, it may, become more, may be more subtle, and it's harder to detect, but rest assured it's still there, and we need to fight to minimize it. Now, you asked for an example. I guess what really shook me was back when I was about 19 years old, going to San Antonio College. That was a junior college at the time. Now they call it a community college. But anyway, it was the summer of 1971, I believe it was. It may have been 70. But anyway, I applied for a bank job, which is a small bank. And then the, I think it was the president, because in those, when you had a small bank, the president did a lot of things that the presidents of banks now do not do. They have assistance to do it. But he called me in and said, look, I think you're the most qualified. And I said, does that mean I get the job? He said, well, I have to be honest with you. I said, what do you, what do you mean? He said, if I hire you, even though you're the most qualified, I will lose the majority of my customers. And my heart pretty much hit the floor. And I said, well, appreciate it, sir. Thank you for your honesty. That gave me a steely determination that no one was going to stop me from doing what I wanted to do. I was angry, but at the same time, it motivated me to no end. Because to me, there were people out there saying, because you are a certain color of a certain race, you should not be here. And I wanted so badly to prove them wrong. And I think I have. But as I stated before, Racism is still around. It's just that people are more sophisticated in how they display their racism. It's hard to detect a lot of times. And part of that, insofar as employment discrimination is concerned, the standard is so high. And I say that because really this, the law favors the employer. And I um, don't know if that's something you should continue with or not because in all fairness, if you have a really low standard, then everybody will be filing some type of discrimination suit and then businesses will not function. But I do think we need to do more in so far as when there is a real case of, of racism or sexism or religious discrimination or any other type of discrimination, I do not think that a plaintiff should have to move mountains to prove his or her case. Well, Judge, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And, and related to that, you know, one thing I'm curious from your perspective, you know, as a federal judge, um, uh, obviously your types, a lot of cases you handle deal with or touch on racism, how people are treated in the workplace, certain civil rights issues, et cetera. And so do you often feel like you can't be, uh, I mean, obviously you, you just were with us um, and I value that. Do you feel like there are times when you can't be as outspoken as you wish you could because of the role as a federal judge? 
Absolutely, that's correct. Because a judge was supposed to cut it down the middle. He or she is supposed to base his decision or her decision on the facts of the case and the applicable law. The minute you start injecting your feelings into your opinions or your writings, then somebody is going to call and say that you're unfair, you're biased, or you're prejudiced. I always like to say we're like referees in a football game or umpires in a baseball game. Umpires call balls and strikes. If it's in the strike zone, it's a strike. And that's done without any bias toward any team. If, it's, if you're a referee in a football game and there's pass interference, you call it. Or somebody steps on the line, he, he is out of bounds. And so you call it. You do not say, well, I like this team. I want this team to win. That's the way judges should be also. Because when you do not cut it down the middle, persons, not just litigants, but our whole country will lose faith or our citizens will lose faith in, in the judicial system. Now, you know, there's a lot going, going on right now, whether you are a Democrat, Republican, or an independent. I would hope that most people in the judicial branch are impervious to all that's going on and make their decisions solely based on the law. After all, I've said this before in other forums, I think the reason we have a democracy is because of the third branch of government. I'm talking about the judicial branch. Back in 1974, when President Nixon did not want to give up those tapes, the Watergate tapes, or whatever they were, it went to the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court voted 8-0. Some of those judges were appointed by Republican presidents and some by Democrat presidents. But when it came out to the rule of law, the Constitution prevailed, and all eight justices who voted said he could not withhold those tapes. That's what I mean by following the rule of law. No individual, not the president, not the um, Speaker of the House, not the majority leader in the Senate, is above the Constitution. And I just hope that all judges keep that in mind. If that is kept in mind, our democracy will continue to strive. Amen. So, Judge, in your role, in your role as judge, and obviously visiting with your colleagues, you know, I, I remember before, before I come for you. Let, let me say one other thing, Grant. Yes, Grant. please. A lot of people, many people do not realize this, but from a personal standpoint, there are decisions that we make all the time that we do not like, but the law compels it. So we're supposed to rule that way. You know, I've made decisions that, that received a lot of attention. I think it was the right ruling, but I know it made people mad. And that, frankly speaking, on some of my rulings, I've been criticized by the Democrats, I've been criticized by Republicans and independents. But they taught us during baby judges school that you have to make a decision based on the law and you have to make your decision without any bias, fear, or sympathy and let the chips fall where they may. Well, how do you, Judge, how do you do that? How do you avoid an echo chamber? How do you avoid your own confirmation bias? Obviously, you have clerks right now. You have Ashley Wright, who's one of the most impressive people I've ever met, um, who obviously keep you in check, um, as well as Susan and others. But how, how do you ensure that you're not living, you know, people always, I think, sometimes think in their minds, oh, the federal judges are up in an ivory tower. They don't know what it's like in the real world. So what do you do to ensure that, you're, uh, that you are escaping an echo chamber and seeing both sides of any discussion? Well, as you pointed out, one check is the law clerks. The law clerks, most of them are young. You're hip. You know what's going on. There's a change in things. Uh, law clerks do not hesitate to tell me. I have an open door policy, and I will tell you right now. I don't require my law clerks to send me an email to talk to me or write a note or all of that. I have an open door policy that they can come see me anytime on any case. Now, sometimes I will set parameters. If I'm working on an opinion or something like that, I may ask someone not to disturb me. But your law clerks can be an excellent sounding uh, board. And certain trends may be prevalent at the time. 
the, the younger lawyers, they will let you know, well, this is what's happened. I may not understand something. I said, well, why is this happening? Why has that happened? They said, Judge, it's the way they're doing things now, such and such. So they enlightened me. But, um, but not only to my law clerks, you know, sometimes people will say, well, how can I contact you? And I'll say, pick up the telephone and call my chambers. Now, you know, the calls are screened, but uh, any person who calls and wants me to speak at a school or wants me to do this or that, come to the school, come to the church to speak, you know, I will do it, okay, because I think judges should be involved in community activities. I think people should get to know their judges. I don't think that a judge should sit up in the quote-unquote ivory tower and shut himself or herself off from the public. After all, you know, I think that's one reason why people say, oh, he's a federal judge. I said, and they'll look at you from a distance as you, as if perhaps you have some kind of communicable disease and they do not want to get too close to you. But I welcome that input because, you know, sometimes people walk up in the store and say, you're Judge Lindsay, and they'll start, cut, start a conversation and they'll say, I'm surprised you're so approachable. I said, why are you surprised? Have you never tried to talk to me? So why are you surprised? I said, well, we just hear this about federal judges and all of that. But I think many times that's because of how we as a group act as federal judges. We should not consider ourselves untouchable. We should go out in the community, meet people. You know, I'm not asking you to lead community, community rallies and all of that, but I think judges should speak at civic events. I think judges should speak at legal seminars and the persons there are, are able to see a different side of the judge. They're able to ask questions after the seminar is over. And then uh, people have told me, lawyers have told me, you're not like anything I've heard. I didn't think I could approach you. And I just smiled. I mean, I said, well, now you see the real thing. But, but always, I would tell anybody, whatever you do, always check the barometer or the thermometer, whatever you want to say. You need to see if things are changing and if the law supports that change. If you see things changing and a law needs to be changed or should be changed, we as judges should not do that. That's for the legislative branch or for some higher court. But I have written in some cases where certain things to be so egregious and I'll say, the court fully realizes that this is not the law. And therefore, I'm going to stay with the law. But it's time that the Fifth Circuit or some other court take a serious review of this issue. Now, whether they do or not, that's up to the appellate court. But nonetheless, you put them on notice that this, that this is something that needs a serious uh, revisit. Well, Judge, you, you mentioned earlier, you know, some of these decisions that could cut both ways and that there are people on the left who might think one thing, people on the right who think another. I think a lot of people probably would assume, oh, you know, these federal judges are just making decisions and moving on with the next, move on with the next. Do some of the decisions that you've made, maybe even some of the more controversial ones, some of the ones that have received more attention, do they weigh on you? I mean, are there some that you continue to think about today? Oh, what if I, you know, what, should I have done this or should I have done that? Or is it by the nature of the job, you must move on to the next decision. You must move on with clarity and know what is settled is settled. Now, pretty much once I make a decision, I may think about it, but it does not weigh on me because, you know, it's not just Sam Lindsay ruling, especially on these controversial decisions that I know that are going to hit the newspaper or hit the media. What I will do is bounce things off my law clerks and something else we do. We'll consult other judges. Hey, I have this issue, that issue. These are the facts. Here's the law. What do you think? So we can bounce things off other judges, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I will say this. Even decisions I have not particularly liked, but they follow the law, I move on because you have to move on. If not, you will be pulled to and fro. And as a judge, you do not wish to be pulled to and fro. You, you have to move on. In fact, we get so many cases, you have to move on to the next fight, so to speak. Because if you become mired, if you become mired in that, then you're letting other work go. So you have to move on. And you have to say to yourself, look, I want to make the best decision possible under the law. Now, no judge ever gets it right. Okay. 
you know, the Fifth Circuit grades our report card. And you know, yes, I've been reversed, but overall, I'm very pleased with my record with the Fifth Circuit. And in the long run, that's who I pay attention to, the Fifth Circuit, what their cases say and what the Supreme Court cases say. When I was a young lawyer, <clears throat> I went before Judge Porter. Judge Porter was a federal judge here. Real, really, he was a really good federal judge. He always had a sense of humor. <laughs> and I couldn't find any authority on this one issue. So I quoted some district court case out of Oregon. And it was right on point. And I went in, went in the chambers and argued. He looked at me and said, Lindsay, is that a district court case? I said, yes, your honor. He said, well, they don't pay any attention to me and I don't pay any attention to them. <laughs> so so uh, <laughs> that was interesting. So he said, they're not any smarter than I am. He said, do you have anything a little bit higher? I said, that's all I have, judge. That's the best I can do. So, but the, but the point being is we try to make the best decision we can when there's no law, and, and that's the position I follow too. I mean, I look for the Supreme Court authority first, the Fifth Circuit next, and then I look for other authority outside the circuit if there's something there. And it's persuasive authority, it may be persuasive, but it's not binding. So that does not mean I have to follow that. I have to try to anticipate, frankly speaking, what the Fifth Circuit would do, what the Supreme Court would do. If you have a hot button issue, you can rest assured it's gonna go up to the Fifth Circuit and probably up to the Supreme Court, but you can't. So, Judge, oh, you can't. You, you, you cannot. Um, what should I say? You cannot constantly reflect on how you have ruled in the past. And here's something else I say too. And I've done this a couple of times. They'll quote me, and I. And even though it didn't go up to the Fifth Circuit, I'll say now that I've thought about that more, the better approach from a legal standpoint is to take this position. And, you know, so I, and they'll say, well, the judge has changed. No, the judge took a more thorough look at the issue. And it's different. And the things were different back five or 10 years ago. And now the court sees the argument that that's being made. Maybe at that time it was not relevant. But as you move on and you see more and more courts leaning that way, you start saying, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a majority view. And I think the majority view view better reflects what the law should be or is. So Judge, we, many of us know you, you obviously as a, as a very good judge, but you were, were also a very, very good trial lawyer when you were city attorney. Are there times that you and I had some very, very um, fun moments, I think, observing advocacy and from, from your perspective, are there moments when you're sitting up on the bench and you're chomping at the bit to take a cross-examination that might not be going very well. I mean, there have been times I've seen you kind of take over the questioning when maybe things weren't happening clearly or were somewhat confusing. But are there times in which you wish you could just jump in there and take the cross-examination? And do you have any, do you have any uh, anecdotes or, or, or stories similar to that effect? Well, I mean, of, yes, of course. I mean, for example, the question's not going well. And and it's not so much a criticism of the lawyer that's asking the questions. I want to make certain that the jury understands what is taking place. Because if you have a jury trial, the jury is the fact finder. The jury is, is the decision maker. And I want to make certain that the jury understands that issue. I mean, I can, you know, I had an excessive force case um, whereby an, the plaintiff was shot in the small intestine. And so what happened was the doctor got up there, started testifying. He said, well, he had a perforated small intestine and we performed an anastomosis. And of course the jury looked, eyes got big. And then the plaintiff's attorney said, well, can you tell us what an anastomosis is? Well, that's a procedure where we, um, go in and there's um, debridement of the wound and we fix him up where he's pretty much good as new. And so, and so finally, I said, does everybody, anybody on the jury understand what the doctor's talking about? And they're all saying, shaking their head, no, 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 no. Have these puzzled looks on their face. 
And I said, doctor, it's very important in your profession to use those esoteric and erudite medical terms. However, there's nobody on the jury who's a doctor or a nurse or anybody who has any medical training. I said, so let me see if I can put the hay down where the cows can get to it. <laughs> Let's say this. Let's say that I have a garden hose that's leaky in the middle of it. It's perforated, it has a bunch of holes. And I don't feel like going to Home Depot or Lowe's and buying a new garden hose. And I say, wait a minute. I can cut out the bad parts, sew it back together. It's five feet shorter, but it still serves the purposes. I said, so I go and get a pair of shears, cut off that, and sew the hole back together. Isn't that essentially what you did to a small intestine? And he said, well, that's exactly what I did. <laughs> I said, well, why didn't you say that? He said, oh, judge, I'm sorry. You know, doctors are used to using big words and, and all of that. And I said, well, I understand that, but I want my job is to make certain the jury understands it. And I guess what I would probably concern me more than anything, the plaintiff's attorney was letting the doctor get away without explaining it. And probably it could very well affect the outcome of the case because the jury didn't understand what happened. You know, he did ask him, did, did, was, did, uh, you know, the defense attorney came back and said, uh, did you get the desired outcome? Did you have a speedy recovery and all of that? But the bottom line is, and this is, to, this, this is a bit of advice to all young lawyers and even seasoned lawyers. Make certain when you talk to the jury, you talk in a language that the jury understands. As I stated before, a jury decides your case if you're in a jury trial. I'm just there to make rulings on the law. If the jury does not understand some complicated process or procedure or understand exactly what happened, then that may cause one side to lose the case. So make certain you have effective communication with the jury. Put aside all the legal reasons and talk to a person or talk to the jury as if you're having a conversation with your neighbor. Well, I said, Grant, I heard you got sued. What happened? And we begin a conversation. You just tell me, well, such and such and such, and you walk through it. There's no, that require, there's no law that requires you to use these big words and 24 letter words to a jury. Remember, you're convincing them, so talk to them, not at them. Very good advice. So it, it takes me to my next question, which is related. What are some of the things that, that you, Judge Lindsay, are looking for, in a, especially young lawyers like us? We walk up to the podium, we start, we stand up, whether it's, whether it's a, I know you don't have that many hearings on motion, so whether it's an oral argument or whether it's a trial, how do you assess someone pretty rapidly? And what are the things that you're looking for within the first five minutes when trying to size someone up from an advocate's perspective? Well, first of all, I understand most lawyers who come before federal judges are nervous. Some of the seasoned lawyers are not as nervous, but I could even see it in them. So I understand that uh, because I remember when I first appeared in federal court. I mean, I walked in there and looked like it, you know, Looked like the floor was two stories and the judge sitting way up there in a the high seat. So it can be pretty daunting or intimidating. But I think the first thing what lawyers have to work on, especially young lawyers, is be able to show a certain degree of poise, poise or self-confidence. You know, you should not approach the judge reading what you're going to say. Look at the judge and tell him or her, Your Honor, this is an issue to concern such and such. This is why I think we should prevail on our motion for summary judgment. And you should be able to do that without reading. The mistake that a lot of lawyers make is they start reading their points. Engage the judge, look straight at him or her, and the judge may have a question. You know, you know a lot of times we're sort of like appellate judges. When somebody's arguing a motion, it's just like, in a way, arguing before the Fifth Circuit. And, you know, you know I argued a number of times before the Fifth Circuit. And I soon learned to say, your honors, uh, all of you read the briefs and are you familiar with the facts? And I do not think there's a need to go over the facts, but if you want some particular area of the facts to be um, stressed, I'll be happy to do that. And they'll say, no, Mr. Lindsay, we've read the briefs. We can dispense with the facts. Let's cut right to the chase and go to the legal issues. 
So be prepared to go right to the legal issues. You should assume that the judge has already read your brief or whatever. And what the judge is looking for is something that will help him or her decide that case based on what you say. That's why you should go to your strong points immediately. So it, it, it's, it's a level of confidence. And how, how well, see, see, if a person has to read all the time, then he or she is not that well prepared with neither the facts or nor the law. And that's very important. But one thing you do, and once you be sure to tell the judge, whether you before me or at the appellate level, why you think the lower court wrongly decided the case, or tell me why you think you should prevail on your motion for summary judgment or motion to dismiss. So you should not be fun with a bunch of papers. I mean, if, and I know this happens a lot of times. And the partners at these big law firms, they will have an associate or senior associate argue the motion. And I think that's great because they need the courtroom experience. So, but you need to come in there with some confidence. Do not be shuffling a bunch of papers. Cut to the chase. Tell the judge why you should prevail. So, Judge, in, in addition to these tips, as you know, for those of us who, who have the opportunity to clerk for a judge, one of the values of that is people will call you after the clerkship and say, hey, tell me about this judge. And so I get calls all the time. Grant, I have this case in front of Judge Sam Lindsay. What's he like? Give me the scoop. How do I impress him? So what, how would you answer that question? The question specifically, what's he like? Kind of give, give me the gist of, of Judge Lindsay. How would you answer that question? Well, I guess you could say that he has a rural background. He doesn't put on airs. And once you get to know him, he's down to earth. He's a straight shooter. And he wants you to be well prepared. He wants you to tell him why you should prevail on a motion or any kind of legal issue there is. He does. He's not for a lot of fluff. I do not want to go and get lost in the weeds. I want to have enough information to make a decision. In other words, I always, I won't say always, but many times I hear people say, you're different from what I thought. I said, why is that? Well, I heard that you're reserved and you're standoffish or such and such. And I say, have you ever tried to talk to me? Well, no, because that's what I heard. I said, we can't believe on everything you hear. And I think, as I said before, earlier in this, this conversation, I think part of the problem is some judges give off that impression. I mean, after all, federal judges are part of the community and they should not distance themselves from the community. Now, I'm not, I am not saying you should go out there and put yourself in danger because there are safety concerns. However, I think that federal judges should be engaging. I told you earlier in this chat, I have an open door policy and I think most of my law clerks would say that. I do not, you know, unless I'm working on something really, really hot, I do not close the door in my conference room and shut myself off from the rest of the office. I think that I think as a good as to establish a good rapport, judges should have that type of relationship with their law clerks and the rest of the staff. Well, that was one thing I, I always appreciate was being able to walk in and out. Even to do our we would do the crossword puzzles and you would crush me uh, every time we would do the Dallas Morning News crossword puzzle. We'd race each other. That wasn't even a contest. Um, let me ask you this. You've been doing this for 20 plus years. Um, you know how it goes. You've seen almost everything. I'm sure there are some, some novel moments. What is it about the job? I mean, each morning you get up, you go to the court, although now with COVID it's a little bit different, but what about this job brings you the most joy? What has kept you up on the bench enjoying your job, enjoying the challenge? Well, there's several things. First of all, I like to see young lawyers grow and develop. And in the 22 years that I've been here, I have seen probably 28, 29 lawyers do that. Because what they learn from me, they can use in the world. But more importantly, I want to see them successful, to be successful. And it lifts my spirits when I think that I am a 
maybe just a small part of that success. But also, when I, you know, supervise them, interact with them, I am telling them this is how we judge, this is how we practice law, so that they can carry those skills into the world, not only for themselves, but help train others. There's nothing I like more than a success story with one of my law clerks. The other thing is that you said, what keeps me going? It's the fact that you can make a difference in a person's life. You know, I've had, in the 22 years, thousands of cases, you know, well over 100 trials, probably 100 to 125 trials, both civil and criminal trials. And you really are in a position to do justice. You know, there are always competing interests. Oftentimes there's a balancing test. But in the end, you have to pull the trigger if it doesn't get to trial as to whether who wins and who loses. And I can say fortunately, for the vast, vast majority of times, the Fifth Circuit has agreed with me. And so that tells me, okay, I am doing something right. Now, I will say this, I kind of hinted at it earlier. I don't know any judge who's never been reversed by the appellate court. Whether it's, the bottom line is, most of the times it's probably meritorious, but sometimes certain hot button issues can become political. And if that's the case, there's nothing you can do but do the best you can. And I'm not blaming one side or the other because it all depends on uh, what the issue is and how society views that issue. See, many times, um, the public thinks courts are tone deaf or judges are tone deaf. That's not the case. That's one reason why I tell all of you, and you, and you alluded to it a while ago, read some newspaper every day. I'm talking about a mainstream newspaper. You want to read other newspapers, that's fine. Know what's going on. Watch the news. You still got some respectable news outlets. I'm not talking about these stations that are so one-sided, okay? And I'll just say this. If I go to MSNBC, I know it's going to be one slant. If I go to Fox, I know it's going to be another slant. Okay. But their news, their, their mainstream stations that come on at 530 every evening that they will pretty much tell it to you like it is. That's how you stay informed. Now, I'm not telling you not to read other things. You wanna read something that's liberal, that's fine. You wanna read something that's conservative, that's fine. But learn how to distinguish between fact and fiction. And learn how to, to discover when there's a spin put on something, when there's a half truth. And I say this, for example, Maybe I shouldn't be saying this given all the controversy, but this is an old antidote, so I'm going to use it. If somebody wants to criticize me, that's fine. They don't have 67 votes to impeach me, so we'll go ahead on with that. <laughs> all right. There was this, there's this antidote that says this Russian and, an, and this American have a foot race. The American wins, but the American goes back to his country and says that he got second and the American got next to last. And so all of his countrymen, they cheer him on and all like that. What he did not tell the people was that there were only two people running. When most people envision, envision a track race, they, figure, they see people running in eight lanes or perhaps nine lanes. So what he said was true he did get second, and the American got next to last. What he did not say was there are only two people in the race. That changes the metrics, the, the dynamics, the whole lot. And that's what I'm saying. A lot of these, some of these news stations and these commentators, they don't reveal everything. As this one old lawyer told me once before when I was a young lawyer, and uh, the, there's another seasoned lawyer on the other side. And he told me, he said, watch him, son. That old lawyer slicker than boy Loker. So 
<laughs> what he was telling me was, do not let him get the best of you because everything he says is not quite true. And you need to point that out to the judge. No, it's, and the other thing, it's another, thing I, another thing I enjoy just quite a bit, I enjoy immigration proceedings because, you know, in a regular case, I know that I'm going to make half the parties mad and half the lawyers mad. On, on, on immigration proceedings, everybody's happy because everybody's becoming a new citizen to the United States. And everybody's happy, full of festivities. We even allow cameras, folks to take pictures. So that's one day that nobody's upset with the judge. Now, judge, but, not even clerking, I mean, those naturalization ceremonies, I, I know you, you're somewhat unique in that you'll have people come up and it's not rehearsed and people, you know, share their, their stories. And there were some pretty incredible moments uh, that I witnessed in your courtroom. So we've got 12 more minutes. I've got one more question and then we're going to open it up for other people uh, to ask questions. But let me, let me leave you with this judge. When you decide to retire, which I hope is never, I hope you never decide to retire, but when you do, um, what do you, what do you want? You know, you and I've always talked about, you know, legacy is for someone else to decide. Right. And that's, that's true. And I, I get that. But what do you want the young lawyers who have been before you to say, what do you want your colleagues on the bench, your colleagues in the fifth circuit to say, what do you want your, your former clerks to say uh, when you do finally retire and you take a step back from the bench? Well, well, that's a tough question. Well, let me say this first of all. I am not one who seeks commendation or approbation. You know, everybody wants to be liked, but if I'm not, you know, so be it. Uh, what I have to remember is that I have to be confident with myself, what I have done. If, I, if anybody's going to make a statement about me, I would say he was fair. He did not play the game. He told it like it was. Didn't fa play favorites. And he decided the law as best as he could. I think I'm confident people will be saying that. Uh, I'm confident of that. So, Judge, thank you so much. I I'd like to open it up for other people to ask questions. You can feel free to send them to me, but a uh, judge would rather not hear from me um, anymore and uh, would rather hear from you. So I think we have the ability for you to hit the, the raise the hand feature and Sherry will, uh, will accept your question or your invitation to ask the question. So I encourage you to do so. Now, Grant, I didn't quite say it like that. I did not want to hear from you. <laughs> that was my spin. That was my spin. Okay. All right. <laughs> but I, I encourage you all to ask as many questions as you can, as many questions as you like. Anything, Sherry? Uh, I see one came in through the Q&A button. Oh, perfect. So, Judge, here's a great question. Um, you've, you've accomplished a significant amount. Um, by the way, shout out to your law clerk, Ashley Wright. Um, you've, accomplished, you've accomplished quite a bit throughout your life, Judge. What is, what is the accomplishment, whether it's with your family, um, as, a, as, a, as a mentor, as a judge, as a city attorney, um, what, are, what accomplishment are you the most proud of? You know, you are the typical interviewer. That question is always asked, somebody being interviewed, and I'm reticent to say what is the most important thing that I've done, the most significant accomplishment, because I have to watch that, because if it's a case, some, some lawyer or some party may say, I thought my case was more significant and more important than that. But I guess if you go back to the city, probably the most significant accomplishment for a, from a legal standpoint was the curfew ordinance, which the city of Dallas created, drafted. It was struck down initially by the district judge here. And I was just, at the time it was struck down, I'd just become city attorney, but I was active in, um, in getting it adopted by the city council. It went to the Fifth Circuit and went down there and argued. I personally argued the case. 
and the Fifth Circuit wrote an opinion overturning the district judge and uh, reinstituting the curfew ordinance. It went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court denied cert. And I guess the good thing about it is since we enacted the uh, curfew ordinance, ordinance, a number of cities across the nation patterned their ordinances after ours. So I think that's great because uh, one of the most significant things about the curfew ordinance was that there's no question that it saved a number of teenagers from being injured or even killed. In fact, there was an incident in which a lady called me just sobbing and I didn't know what was going on. So anyway, she just said, I just, I'm, I'm so glad you didn't give up on the curfew ordinance. My son did not go out last night because of the curfew. His two buddies went out and both of them got shot. Thank God they wow. did not die. But I'm just so glad that you fought for us and it made a difference. Those are the kind of things that are invaluable. You know, yes. those kind of things mean more than any plaque or award that I have received. That's one. Judge, um, let, let me ask you this. How can, you know, we've talked, we've touched on some of these issues, but how can we as young lawyers move the needle in terms of ensuring we, we have a more diverse, uh, a more diverse group in the legal profession? What are some of the things that we can tangibly do to accomplish that? Okay, first of all, this will go even back before you. Um, there has to be a pool of qualified minority candidates. When I say minorities, I'm talking about all races, different, different, uh, all races, I'm talking about um, females and so forth. For example, at the University of Texas, now I think the enrollment between male and female is pretty much 50-50. The, the female enrollment may be slightly, slightly higher. A lot of minorities not fare that well. And what young people, young lawyers can do is convince the partners that there is a value to diversity. And years back, I was talking to Tom Morris, who used to be the general counsel of Walmart. And he said, Judge, we had to think and redirect our efforts. We were going to go into these undeveloped countries. And we realized, you know what? We need a more diverse workforce so they can see us. And they would trust us. They would accept us. What, I would, what, what, what the young lawyers need to do, convince the partners, not that it's diversity for diversity's sake, but it's diversity because it makes good business sense. That's when you get the power brokers listen to you. If you just say, I think it ought to reflect the population of the country, that dog will not hunt. What you have to do is say, look, it makes good business sense and here's why. Then they will listen to you. Then the corporations like Walmart, Coca-Cola, when they go outside, many a times they will require a law firm to have minority participation. But I think insofar as a law firm is, is concerned, I think the young lawyers can have tremendous influence on the power brokers, the partners, the senior partners. Look, we need to increase our minority participation. But not only increase it, you need to retain it. The complaint I hear from a lot of bl young black lawyers is everything goes good those five or six years, seven years. But when it comes to that ninth year, whatever year, becoming a partner, a couple of years before that, their work is criticized. They get fewer hours and all that kind of stuff. And then lo and behold, when they're up for partnership, they do not make it. That's what I'm hearing. And I'm not going to mention any names because, but I, because I don't want anybody to get in trouble. But uh, there's not anything anybody can do to me in that regard, but, 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 but I think that the young lawyers enjoy a very important position in, in a convincing the senior lawyers how things have changed and what value diversity brings to the ranks. No, it's very good advice, very good practical advice. I think sometimes it's difficult to wrap your head around tangible ways as opposed to just discussing it in the abstract. So we've got time for just a couple more questions. Before, before I go to those, just as a reminder, Jasmine wanted me to point this out. There are two upcoming events for, for this series. Uh, November 18th at 12 p.m., Judge Carl Stewart uh, will be here. Actually, Judge Lindsay introduced me to him. Um, so Judge Carl Stewart, November 18th. And then on December 3rd at noon, uh, retired Justice Carolyn Wright will, uh, will be the guest. So both 
fantastic uh, members, uh, fan fantastic judges uh, who will be really, really interesting to listen to. So judge, for, for, some, uh, for some of us, many people, many young lawyers not only aspire to be um, advocates, but also judges, whether it's a criminal judge, a uh, state civil judge, a uh, federal, federal district court judge, appellate judge, Supreme Court justice. What are some of the things that you would recommend at, at a young age to do to set yourself up for ultimately achieving that position? Well, I think one thing you should do is uh, be, be active in litigation. This doesn't mean you have to try a bunch of cases, but you should know how cases are tried. I mean, you should be able to take a, you should have a, tried a case from start to the end. Doesn't mean you necessarily have to win the case, but you, so you know what's involved in a case, you know about courtroom techniques. And in that, in that, in, in that vein, I would always tell any lawyer, make sure that if, you, if you're gonna try a case, you know what the judge prefers or what the judge likes and dislikes. Like for me, I have written procedures, but you also can call my courtroom deputy or my court coordinator and she will tell you what Judge Lindsay expects. Also, for technical equipment, there's training, you know, things like that. So, but, but uh, overall, have a good working knowledge of the law. Um, and I will say this, no prominent to keep people in the legal profession because that's who the president's going to listen to most of the times. If you have some type of connection with key people. And of course, uh, in the last, this is where I cannot help you because when I went through, politics was not a big deal. Oh, you know, there were some rumblings, but in the last, I would say 12, 15 years of politics, 15 years or so, politics has become really important. Like, you know, I was blessed. I got confirmed, you know, 98-0. You don't see that that often now because there's such a toxic, toxic atmosphere in Washington. And I'm not saying whom is to blame. I know that it's there. I know a lot of people right now just will not even apply because they say this atmosphere is too toxic. But the bottom line is become well qualified, all right? And if you've, you've tried cases and get a published case, that's great. If you try, you know, something goes up to the Fifth Circuit, ask them to publish that opinion for you. Those kinds of things. Very good advice. All right, Judge, here's the last, last question. Several people have picked up on your, um, some of your lingo. So that dog will not hunt, slicker than boiled okra, put the hay down to where the cows can get to it. Um, so what is, uh, what is your take on using those types of phrases, some phrases that are helpful and illustrative in briefing or in oral argument. This will be our, our last question. Well, those questions, those things are to make it plain. Those, those sayings, you know, they may not be as, as sophisticated or erudite as say the late Charles Allen would write in his book on federal courts or, or constitutional law but they make it plain. That's, that is an effort to connect with the jury. When you say put the hay down where the cows can get to it, that's saying stop all the big words, just make it plain and clear. When you say that dog will not hunt, you're saying I doubt that that's a good legal theory. Another time you might say, you know, I wouldn't ride that pony to the race. You need to ride your best pony to the race. In other words, you're not, make, you're not making your strongest legal argument. Okay, but, um, but no, but the reason why I do that, to be quite honest with you, you know, sometimes trials can be boring. Juries like a little levity. They like something humorous. You say something humorous, people tend to remember it better. But that's just, that's to liven things up. And frankly speaking, you know, um, where I grew up, those sayings are quite common, are fairly common. And that's how people uh, connected. They were used to make a point. But let me just say this. I mean, I don't know how long your session lasts, but um, well, you have to cut it off or not. If, if anybody wants to stay longer, I'm happy to answer questions. So they, you know, that's, it. that's up to you. It's all of you. It looks like uh, Marisa Thompson, do you still, I think she raised her hand. Do you have a question? Hi, can you all hear me? 
Yes. yes. Okay. My question for you, Judge, was you mentioned that lawyers need to be confident and bring that confidence into the courtroom when engaging in conversation with the judge. How do you suggest young lawyers work on developing that confidence? All right. The first thing I would say is to know your case or know your emotion inside mm -hmm. and out. The only reason you should have your notes up there would be for a prop. And that's, you know, and frankly speaking, since it is a situation that can cause nervousness, not just to the new lawyer, but also to the seasoned lawyer, your notes and other things should be there to help you regain your place in the event a court asks you questions. Because judges will interrupt your argument all the time. Because they those that judge has that judge knows where he or she wants to go. And they'll and that judge will cut right to the chase. So I would say know your case inside and out. And in other words, it's kind of like a spare tire. All your tires are good. You can make your destination. But just in case you have that spare in the trunk, you hope you never have to rely on it. And I've seen young lawyers do this. It, should, it, it takes practice, but you have to know your case inside and out. There should never be a fact that a judge brings up that you do not know about. And I've seen that happen before. Um, I've asked lawyers certain questions and they said, well, I don't recall that judge. I said, well, it's in your brief and it's also in the record. And then they're stumbling around fumbling for something. So just, just know your case, first of all. And number two is practice before you come to the courthouse. Get another associate or get a senior associate or get a partner and a partner will, will, will uh, critique you. Ask the person to videotape it and you can see yourself, how you reacted. Let somebody play judge and ask you hard questions. Those kind of things you, you will, um, I think it'd be quite effective. The key is really this, preparation, preparation, preparation. You cannot take it for granted. All right, Judge, to everyone, thank you so much for everyone's time. Judge, you're a treasure, we value you, we do not take you for granted. Thank you for doing this and I uh, hope everyone can join. Uh, the next session with uh, with Judge Stewart. So with that, signing off, Sherry, anything else? No, thank you. Have a great day. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Stay healthy. Stay safe. All right. Thank you.